Okay, let's get started with our second session of this morning. And this will be devoted to um, trying to reconstruct past climates as a way to understand uh, the working of the climate system and use the knowledge that we acquire to maybe say something about projections uh, and constraining better projections of future uh, climate change. And our first speaker this morning is Thomas Stocker from the University of Bern and the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei, and he'll be talking about surprises in the climate system. So I'll let you speak for 30 minutes and then we'll... Thank you very much, and I uh, would like to thank the Academy for the kind invitation and the timely organization of this important conference. I'm talking about surprises in the climate system, and uh, before I want to delve into the topic, uh, I thought I would like to remind ourselves on uh, the uh, report that uh, came out just exactly one month ago by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In fact, it was the sixth assessment report, and here with the first installment on the physical science basis, essentially looking at the question, what do we know, what don't we know about the climate system? One of the impressive results, uh, a result that uh, has been refined over the last 20 years is enshrined in this figure, figure number one in the summary for policymakers, that shows the evolution of global mean surface temperature over the last 2,000 years. And the statement that goes along with that, approved in consensus by 195 countries, reads global surface temperature has increased faster since 1970 than in any other 50-year period over at least the last 2,000 years. And that statement has been made with high confidence. But let us open up the perspective even more. I show you the evolution of the last 60 million years, starting in the early Eocene. Uh, this is figure number one from the technical summary. Um, that shows in the top panel the atmospheric CO2 concentration and in the lower panel estimates, measurements and ultimately projections of global mean surface temperature. So we had climates 60 million years ago that were warmer with much higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Natural climate evolution, as you see in concert temperature and carbon dioxide, not always in exact correlation, of course, because there are other processes in the climate system that determine surface temperature. The late Pleistocene, uh, that is the period we know best because we have uh, very special paleoclimatic archives that will be presented in more detail by Carlo Babante uh, later on. These are the polar ice cores that show us in great precision the variations of carbon dioxide and temperature. Then finally, the observational period and in the Anthropocene, I permit myself to use that uh, expression, in the Anthropocene, the projections uh, that are being presented in the latest IPCC report out to the year 2300. What you see from this figure is that within about 150 years, we come close to the temperature and carbon dioxide uh, conditions in these scenarios that have uh, been prevailing uh, about 60 million years ago. So a long time the climate system has evolved just by itself until it's now forced by the burning of fossil fuels. Just to give you an impression how the surface temperature looks like in these different uh, epochs, early Eocene, mid Pliocene, and 2020, you see that in the projections uh, based on a series of general circulation models that were forced with these uh, emission scenarios in the year 2100, we're basically um, bringing back for a high emission scenario the surface temperature uh, between the mid Pliocene and the early Eocene for the year 2300, actually much more dramatic. Of course, these are extreme scenarios, but it is incumbent to the science to actually explore what happens, what are the impacts, uh, according to our knowledge today, of high emission scenarios in order to accumulate arguments to avoid precisely such scenarios. 
Now let's turn to um, the uh, issue of surprises in the climate system. If you've seen that uh, graph before, uh, it would actually be a surprise if there were no surprises in the future uh, due to the rapidity and the amplitude of the forcing. Just uh, to remind ourselves of what we understand uh, in terms of tipping point or irreversible changes, I show here a very old figure, a schematic figure that we have uh, brought into a box, an explanatory box in the projection chapter in AR4 in 2007. What you see here is a forcing that uh, over some time evolves, remains stable and goes back to an original value. The response, on the other hand, can be different uh, according to the different uh, processes and feedbacks in the climate system. For example, it could be a rather linear response, as you see in the dashed curve uh, that uh, uh, just evolves in the system. Uh, it could be a uh, linear, uh, very smooth response that goes back to the original uh, 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 state uh, under a linear assumption, but you could also have abrupt changes either here or at the end of that forcing period uh, due to feedbacks that are nonlinear. So that was in the year 2007 when we sort of tried to capture the notion of surprises that was used in this report. Since then, a lot of science has happened. Uh, I should also say a lot of speculation at the same time has happened. Uh, this is a, a picture that sort of summarizes what you find in the literature in terms of tipping points or surprises. Some very well studied um, uh, processes and events such as uh, the overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean, I will say more about that. And some uh, really underexplored and not uh, understood uh, systems like the jet stream, whether or not that atmospheric flow regime could actually show different equilibria or irreversible changes, that's really not known. Apart from the physical uh, tipping points or tipping elements, there are also biological ones, boreal forests, tropical coral reefs in the marine realm, but also um, ice sheet instabilities as you see here, and I will go into those as well in the remaining time. So let me now organize uh, what's uh, uh, remaining in this presentation in three parts, observations, modeling, and assessment. We start with this uh, curve here that shows the temperature reconstruction over the last 120,000 years based on stable isotope analysis of a Greenland ice core. And we have now several of these ice cores that all tell us the same story. And the story is the last 10,000 years were a climate of relative stability and warmth. The last ice age was a very dynamic climate, at least in Greenland, and the question is, has that some global impact, of rapid warmings and coolings, as I indicate in these color bars, for example, for event number 12 or event number zero. You see here temperature swings in Greenland that we estimate at a amplitude of about eight to 16 degrees Celsius over a couple of decades. So extremely rapid warming and cooling uh, registered in Greenland. Let me go back to my predecessor at the University of Bern, Hans Oeschger, many of you uh, perhaps remember him. Uh, he has analyzed with his team in the late 80s a uh, lake sediment core uh, just uh, outside of the university at Lake Gertzensee. And this analysis has shown some interesting periods of high and low values of the oxygen 18 concentration of the carbonates stored in this lake sediment. It is a, a, a lake that uh, was formed when the glacier uh, that came from the Bernese Alps was retreating, and so we can register climate changes at around uh, 15,000 years onward. And this signature that uh, they found in 1984 and published looked very similar to a signature that a friend of Hans Oeschger, Willy Donsgaard, from the University of Copenhagen has measured also using mass spectrometry in uh, a Greenland ice core. And you see that these two curves at that resolution show a very high 
correlation, which led the two friends to believe and to state that what they see in Greenland has actually a larger regional, if not hemispheric, significance of a sequence of rapid coolings and warmings. At the same time enters uh, this person, Wally Broker, that was mentioned already before uh, the stage, where he said, with a rather revolutionary idea, uh, maybe the ocean circulation is responsible for that, and it could actually be that the ocean has different modes of operation. That's how he called it. And of course, as a geochemist, he knew that there is a large-scale, global-scale circulation pattern which is completely simplified and wrongly depicted scientifically in this image, but it was an image that captured so many spirits uh, to dig further and do more research that I permit myself to show it. It's the global conveyor belt that uh, exemplifies the meridional heat pump in the Atlantic Ocean in that it transports warm water northward and cold water southward, the only ocean basin that this is the case. Another person came onto stage, uh, Sigfus Jonsson, uh, who actually said, look, if I analyze the Antarctic core and the Greenland core, and this is a quote that he did in our coffee room, I still remember that very vividly, Antarctic temperature seems like the time integral of Greenland temperature, but I don't know why. But he asked the correct question, and together then we uh, looked uh, in more detail what could be the mechanism for that, and in fact, it is this global conveyor belt in the Atlantic Ocean that through a bipolar seesaw and the heat reservoir of the Southern Ocean uh, uh, provides this integrator of abrupt change in the North Atlantic and a more smooth integrated temperature uh, evolution in the Southern Ocean and in Antarctica. That was 2003, and 2006, finally, with a high-resolution Antarctic ice core, we could confirm this hypothesis that, indeed, the ocean is responsible for a large-scale global signal, which manifests itself as abrupt change, you could say surprises, in the North Atlantic region. Europe is mostly affected uh, by that, and a smoother version in the south, in uh, the Southern Ocean, as you see here in the Antarctic ice core from Droning Maudland. The question, of course, is, are we looking at a system that could also manifest surprises today? And here I show you uh, the longest record that is so far observed in the North Atlantic through a rapid uh, research program by the UK and the US uh, that uh, uh, is monitoring uh, important elements of the ocean circulation since 2004. Uh, you see here the time series of different uh, components of this circulation, and I just would like to focus your attention to the second top curve, the red curve, which is this conveyor belt overturning circulation strength at around 20 sverdrups, 20 million cubic meters of water transport per second. And what you can see in this uh, fascinating time series is a lot of natural variability. That by itself was a surprise to the oceanographer. But you can also say, if you are uh, perhaps a bit more daring, there may be a trend here. And uh, just by eye, you may see a trend here. That was one of the first papers published. But then other people came around and said, uh, well, maybe this is a trend. And you can already see how unrobust such analyses are on relatively short time series. So it's really a difficult question whether or not this conveyor belt circulation or this meridional overturning circulation, as did in the past, is actually uh, weakening. Well, for that, uh, you need more indicators. You need fingerprints. And uh, the science has really made a lot of progress in investigating the potential of fingerprints. Uh, uh, the team here has analyzed sea surface temperature changes and temperature changes of the top 1,000 meters along with sea surface height changes. And what they see is indeed some uh, uh, reduction of uh, these indicators for that circulation, but they were extremely careful by stating that uh, it seems that uh, the uh, circulation has 
changed the state from between uh, 2009 before and after. They don't really state that this is a long-term decrease that we have identified, but something is happening that goes beyond the natural variability that is accessible in these time series. Another study in 2018 looked at uh, sea surface temperature changes uh, based on early data and then later on uh, much higher density data over the Gulf Stream region and the subpolar gyre region. And they identified a warming in the south and a cooling in the north, which is one of the typical fingerprints if that heat bump that I showed you is weakening. Less delivery of heat into the subpolar areas, hence a cooling, and uh, basically a storage, an increased storage of heat in the more southerly latitudes. So the system is changing, is evolving, and we will see through the modeling whether or not that could actually be early signals of a longer term uh, reduction of that circulation. Another system are the polar ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica are both losing mass at an accelerated pace. About 10 years ago, we could not yet say with certainty that there is an acceleration, but now I think that has been confirmed, as you see here from these satellite measurements, both in Greenland at about 400 gigatons per year and Antarctica at about a third of that. Interesting, in Antarctica on the right panel, you see a blue curve that is more or less flat. That is the surface mass balance. Uh, the other curve, the purple curve, dips downward. That is the total mass loss. Uh, so the conclusion out of that uh, picture is that Antarctica is losing mass around its perimeter where it's in contact with the warming ocean. And that is also the focal area of some recent studies that look at the stability of the West Antarctic ice streams. Uh, you see here an enlarged part uh, with the bad topography um, of Antarctica, extremely uh, structured. And if you focus into that red square, you see here rates of elevation change, all negative. These are sort of uh, the points where some researchers would actually argue that we will lose a lot of ice through these uh, glaciers that are located in this area that are under uh, uh, taken by, um, by ocean water that is warming and basically destabilizing these ice streams. So this is another rather well-researched system in the Earth system that has the potential to show surprises in the future and is also undergoing relatively rapid changes. Let's now look at the modeling, just uh, an example of uh, using um, essentially state-of-the-art uh, climate models 10 years ago. They were not that bad, but uh, uh, arguably they do not uh, contain all the processes that uh, would be relevant to actually um, uh, uh, show a robust result on these surprises. Here, scenarios of different uh, warming levels over the next uh, 500 years, uh, out to the year 2600, and the responses of this conveyor belt circulation. As you can see, a bifurcation in that particular model, uh, bifurcations that have also been confirmed in simpler models, uh, uh, but yet uh, not a consensus available on this question whether or not we will actually go through a bifurcation sometime in the 21st century regarding that overturning circulation. A circulation, incidentally, and I refer here to Andy Watson's presentation, that is an important uh, part of distributing the carbon that is taken up by the ocean. Other simulations that are available uh, concern uh, the ice sheets and ice streams. Here, a simulation by Juggin a couple of years ago that uh, does show for different uh, parameterizations of the inter action between uh, the ice stream and the bedrock that uh, abrupt changes of uh, the mass loss can actually appear in these glacier areas in Antarctica in the next few decades. So it is a physical possibility, but it is certainly too early to be confident about that. 
The last surprise I would like to highlight is a surprise that may be generated by ourselves uh, and the action that we take to uh, combat climate change. You've probably all heard about uh, geoengineering, very controversial um, uh, remedy in quotes and unquotes uh, to combat the warming by not reducing uh, the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, but by bringing into the lower stratosphere uh, particles, sulfate aerosols that would reflect part of the sunlight and therefore lead to a cooling. That's symbolized here in this picture. Uh, some early simulations that were done um, for IPCC for the fifth assessment report are summarized in these two figures. Two scenarios, the sort of the linear increase that you see here is a scenario that looks at a consequence of emissions that are continuing to grow over the next 70 years and a second set of simulations that are flat in the global mean temperature evolution over the next 50 years. These are so-called geoengineering scenarios in which a certain amount of sulfate aerosol is being deposited in the atmosphere. The experiment here assumed that at some stage humanity would say, well, uh, we can no longer afford this measure that uh, we have to continually apply to the atmosphere because sulfate aerosols are being washed out from the atmosphere and therefore are no longer actively um, reducing uh, the, uh, the irradiation by the sun. Um, and so we stop and what happens is, of course, um, the temperature needs to adjust again on its characteristic time scale to the evolving carbon dioxide concentration that has not been uh, able been able to stable to be stabilized over these 50 years and so it's sort of like a spring that you load and at some stage at year 50 you let go one end and the system relaxes back to the state where it should be for precipitation that is the same uh, observation. Geoengineering actually in these models leads to a reduction in precipitation. Once you stop the um, emission of sulfate aerosols into the lower stratosphere, you see that precipitation also abruptly changes back on that time scale of around a decade or 15 years. We call that the termination problem and uh, science has progressed in the meantime. Uh, this is uh, arguably a very extreme scenario where from one day to the next you would stop geoengineering. Uh, of course, it's obvious to suggest scenarios where you slowly phase out geoengineering and therefore you would actually relax that termination problem to some extent. But what is certain is that with the application of such um, uh, technologies, uh, you certainly take away the motivation to uh, replace the fossil fuels by other energy uh, sources. Let's come now to the conclusion of my short presentation. Um, surprises are in the climate system. They have been in the past. What we are missing at the moment is really a consensus, a status, a snapshot. Where do we stand in this science? What can we tell to the uh, policymakers and the public in terms of robust knowledge and what is uncertain. At the moment, my view is that in terms of surprises, nonlinear responses of the climate system and irreversibilities, there are lots of open questions. Of course, these issues have been uh, dealt with in a succession of assessment reports of the IPCC, most notably the most recent AR6 and the preceding special reports on global warming of 1.5 degree and the ocean and cryosphere in a cl changing climate. But what we are missing in my view is really a special report on climate surprises or climate tipping points, including the pos possible impacts that the crossing of thresholds could actually imply. Let me come to the conclusions. Siri surprises and abrupt changes did happen frequently in the past. We know that from the high resolution paleoclimate record, not only from the polar ice cores, but from the marine sediments, from tracer distributions reconstructed in the marine sediments, from lake records, from speleothem records, from tree rings, all over the place. 
um, surprises have happened in the past. They are serious possibility in the future. And increased understanding of climate surprises, I think, is needed uh, since this is still a controversial topic. Highest resolution enhanced physics climate models are indispensable. If you look at uh, the message number one out of our climate report from this conference, it's precisely that what this message embodies. Uh, it's not only important to, for example, uh, get better estimates on the statistics and the changing statistics of extreme events, but also I think such highest resolution models hold the potential to provide us with more robust information on climate surprises. There is, I, I should say, no scientific consensus at the moment on surprises and tipping points, including their regional impacts. What does it mean, for example, for atmospheric circulation if some of these tipping points actually uh, happen? Policy making, therefore, is limited by incomplete scenarios. That doesn't mean policy making shouldn't proceed, but in this particular issue of surprises, I think we need more information. And let me just reiterate what I said before. Uh, I think for the science, it would be extremely healthy to have a forum to sit down, prepare a special report, as we have done in the past. Just uh, remember the special report on extreme events in 2012, which has uh, accelerated the science in this area and provides us with much more knowledge today on extreme events uh, than we had uh, 10 years ago. And I think the same will be true for surprises in the climate system if IPCC prepared such a report in the seventh assessment cycle that starts around 2023. With that, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this uh, great talk. And uh, Giovanni, if you want to. Sure. Thank you, Thomas, for this enlightening presentation. Uh, uh, I have two, uh, two questions. The first one concerns the first plot that you presented, which is the, let's say, the, uh, how is it called, the hockey stick, something like that? They call it like that, but it yeah. is actually the temperature anomaly of yeah. the last okay. 2,000 years. <laughs> as, you, as you know much better than me, uh, one of the arguments of deniers is that that plot would uh, underestimate the oscillations of temperature, the anomaly during the medieval. Before the conference, I received a, a <clears throat> message from a colleague from the academy saying, you are ignoring this aspect. So I said, why don't you come and ask Professor Stoker? <laughs> um, and he said that he is very busy. Okay, so I am going to ask you the question that he should have asked you. The second is a curiosity. Talking about the tipping point, what you showed from the past seemed to me oscillations rather than irreversible facts. So can you comment on that? Yeah. So to your first question, are we underestimating natural variability? If we look at uh, what I've shown in, in, in figure one in the first graph that I showed, global mean temperature anomaly over the last 2,000 years. No, we aren't. Uh, paleoclimatic record, foremost tree rings, are recorders of local temperature changes. And not only that, they don't record global uh, annual mean temperature change at that location, but they are seasonally weighted. A tree ring width is not a uh, annual mean temperature. Uh, these issues are very carefully being investigated by tree ring scientists. And uh, by now, we have now a network of hundreds of these records where we can show in much better and greater detail for example, the extent of the Little Ice Age. Uh, this is a period of, uh, that manifested itself, for example, in a, in a large extent of the Alpine glaciers by 
uh, sort of the mid uh, 19th century, uh, caused by a series of volcanic events uh, and uh, some reduction of the solar irradiation. I'm, I'm sure we will hear more about that during that conference from Sami Solanki. Uh, and so these um, natural variabilities that you uh, refer to, these are mostly natural variabilities on a regional scale, and they are captured by these uh, records. In fact, if you take a, an even closer look, you see that the Little Ice Age, what people um, often uh, refer to, is not a global cooling event. It is a regional event, mainly located in uh, Europe, uh, with some expressions in other areas that are not exactly occurring at the same time. So there is still a lot of natural variability, I fully agree with that, but in a global mean temperature record, as you see it here, uh, much of that variability is averaged out. Second question regarding some periodic cycles uh, that you referred to during the last ice age. Uh, haven't mentioned the word. These numbered events are called the Donsgard Oeschger events uh, in honor of these two colleagues and pioneers. These Donsgard Oeschger events are not periodic. If you do a spectral analysis on these events, they are not periodic. Um, it's still one of the questions that we do have uh, whether or not these events are uh, triggered by, for example, freshwater delivery from ice sheets out of uh, the North American continent or the Scandinavian ice sheet or Greenland. Uh, that's uh, some indication. Other indications are that you can destabilize uh, the, this ocean conveyor belt under a regime of the last ice age uh, just by smaller changes uh, that go over thresholds. There are other hypotheses too that these are self-sustained chaotic oscillations with not a clear periodicity. There is one uh, credible simulation that is in a regime where it oscillates in a self-sustained way or it fluctuates, so fluctuates I should say, rather, because it's not completely periodic. Other questions? And as a reminder, please, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, introduce yourself before asking the question. Thank you. Again, Andrea Rinaldo, Lin Chi. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, beautiful talk. Um, um, I, I certainly, like many, cannot escape the fascination of certain terms, however, imprecise, Anthropocene, for instance, as, as was mentioned, I think, by, by others, or the tipping point. But at this point, I want to get back to what uh, Giovanni just asked, because I am interested in tipping points in a broad sense. Are they phase transitions, meaning the system oscillates around a certain state, and all of a sudden, um, the, the basic, the reference state changes? Or is it something more akin to a critical phenomena Maybe I'm interested in, in self-organized critical processes, different from critical processes, where certain things happen no matter what, right? You just let them go regardless of initial conditions, regardless of parameters, uh, the system does the same, which is absolutely fascinating of things. So um, my question, it's a marginal one, of course. I, I completely agree on the use of tipping points uh, as a, and a catchy term, et cetera. But can you speculate a little more? Because that goes in the direction of it. Giovanni mentioned, uh, one thing is fluctuation, one thing is periodicity, one thing is what is exactly a tipping point. Yeah, uh, very much appreciate that question. It's certainly not a, a mathematical definition that I uh, invoke here. Um, climate models have been used uh, in an entire hierarchy. You have uh, simplified mm -hmm. models, you have uh, dynamical models, you have models of reduced complexity where you represent, for example, the ocean circulation only with a, a, a set of uh, uh, very crude assumptions, not the full dynamics. And then you have also high resolution models coupled uh, between the atmosphere, the ocean, some representation of ice sheets in there now emerging as well. So you have an entire hierarchy. And what I can say is that as you go up the hierarchy, the more complex it becomes because the signal is, or the, the, the behavior of these models are, are not categorizable into here we have a tipping point and here not. Uh, take a model of intermediate complexity. These models you can actually push very close to an instability point where 
this overturning circulation transitions into a second mode of circulation which is extremely weak. Very close to that transition point, that model is stable, but not absolutely stable. So if you add a noise into the atmosphere of that model, it can actually flip into that second stage. And what we have seen in these models is that it can flip back or it could also be not be flitting back because it has found mm -hmm. a second more stable equilibrium point. And so it's actually a whole range of behaviors and I'm only, uh, I'm only mentioning the overturning circulation in the Atlantic because this has been a very popular topic in climate modeling. Uh, I think uh, we will see much more results in the ice sheet modeling community that now has ice sheet models that also represent ice streams. Mm -hmm. In ice streams, we know physically there are instability points that uh, once you force the model uh, strongly with a warming, for example, around the margin, ice streams let go. Whether or not they find a new stable point and where that is, that's an open question. So there is a lot of um, open questions here. I wouldn't say, in the literature, you do find a lot of speculation too. I, I, I should say that. And that's precisely why I think that uh, a careful, uh, uh, thorough assessment process, like we've done for extreme events, would actually be quite useful. So I think there are some questions maybe Yeah, from, there is but, a question by But can I follow up on this really quickly? I actually would like to again um, talk a little bit more about the use of the word tipping points uh, in, the, in the literature. A lot of what we know about tipping points and bifurcations is based on very simple models, right? Reduced complexity or even reduced dimensionality. Yeah. But my understanding is that um, once you start including more processes and especially let's say, the role that atmospheric or ocean circulations, then more complex models are less TP than the simple models. Uh, and so I, uh, again, I've been wondering whether it has been wise to introduce the word tipping points. Now everybody's looking for a tipping point in the climate system. You mentioned in your, in your plot, of, there is, for instance, I study monsoons, right. and again, there has been speculation that monsoons might respond. Non-linear, right. in fact, might shut down. Right. And um, I would say that uh, advances in theoretical understanding of monsoons seem to be uh, provide evidence against right. such right. a TP behavior. And so I was wondering if you can it's articulate a little bit Very interesting intervention, which I much appreciate. I, I was reluctant for many years to use actually the notion tipping points. Um, now in a, in a public debate and in in, in non-scientific audiences, if you start with non-linearities and irreversibilities and things like that, people detach. Uh, they are used to simpler expressions. And so it's a vehicle of communication. And I think I accept that, uh, that this is a vehicle of communication. It shouldn't let us carry, be carried away by it and uh, the request of clear definitions, what we mean when we analyze a system a behavior in a model of any complexity is absolutely necessary. I agree with that. With your second point, uh, very interesting um, discussion I had uh, more than 25 years ago when I was visiting MIT. I was presenting some model of intermediate complexity and uh, hysteresis behavior at that time and, and some eminent uh, colleague came up and said precisely what you said, oh, if the models are more complex, uh, all that stuff will disappear because there are so many degrees of freedom and uh, the model is essentially dissipative and, and therefore we will not see these things. So I was very depressed. Uh, well, maybe I'm just chasing something that isn't there. Um, only to learn about 15 years later that uh, people out of that same eminent institution published in very prominent journals um, multiple equilibria uh, based on model simulations of a coupled atmosphere, ocean, three-dimensional general circulation model, infinitely more complex than my simple model, 
with essentially the same conclusions. So, um, just that as a little anecdote. <laughs> Great. So, uh, yes. Uh, Timothy Palmer raised their hand to ask a question. Do we see him? Hi, hi um, I, I wanted to, uh, I, actually my question is, is a little bit around this issue of communication. I, I was on the BBC uh, discussing a paper from the Potsdam Institute on the AMOC, slowdown of the AMOC, and it was presented as A, a complete disaster, and B, that the Gulf Stream would shut down. And I had to remind you know, the listeners that the Gulf, this is really nothing to do with the Gulf Stream, which is a wind force circulation. And the effect of this would be to shift the Gulf Stream slightly to the south and to cool the waters, as you've said, to the north. And then it occurred to me that actually, far from being a disaster, this might be a good thing because you, you showed the loss of uh, ice mass from Greenland. If the cooling actually helps stabilize the loss of ice mass, this could have big ramifications for sea level around the world. So this tipping point may actually be something that could be thought of as a negative feedback on some aspects of climate change. And far from being the disaster that we often present it, it could actually be something that might help us in some respects, at least as far as sea level rise. So here. I, I think, you know, I agree with all of your comments, but I think there are lots of issues here which we haven't, as you say, fully understood. But important amongst those is this communication that we're necessarily talking about, you know, a total disaster to the climate system. We, some of these mechanisms may actually be stabilizing mechanisms. Well, your point is very well taken. I, I think it, it really points to the fact that we need to explore in a comprehensive manner the impacts of such a uh, event should it happen and uh, what you say about the temperatures uh, precipitation uh, accumulation or mass balance uh, of the Greenland ice sheet is absolutely to the point the question is is the feedback strong enough to actually manifest what you said as a remedy for or as a, a mitigating effect of, of losing uh, large parts of the uh, Greenland ice sheet. I think that response is completely open. We don't really know the answer. Uh, being at the components here and comprehensiveness, I would also argue I'd be very interested then to learn what that means for carbon uptake. Um, because we have heard uh, about the meridional overturning circulation, uh, certainly one part, the Southern Ocean being probably much more important, but uh, there can be th things that can happen through the release of fresh water through Antarctic uh, mass loss as well that could stabilize the water column and impact the carbon dioxide uptake uh, easily. And so, yes, I fully agree. We don't really know the full uh, ramifications of crossing such a threshold, if it indeed exists, and that in itself is an open question. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can take one very last question and then move on. Andy Watson from the University of Exeter. Thank you, Thomas, very interesting talk. Um, just on that last issue, it would s slow down. If, if CO atmospheric CO2 is still going up rapidly, then a slowdown or s cessation, a tipping point in the overturning circulation would s fairly drastically slow down the rate of uptake of carbon dioxide into the ocean. That's my opinion. On the more general point that Tim says, well, this particular tipping point might actually be a help, I would say I, I don't... Th I think that by their nature, you know, we are, u we are used to, and the planetary ecosystem is used to, they to a stable climate over the last 10,000 years or so. Uh, therefore, almost by definition, a tipping point is not, a, is not good news. If you slow down the overturning circulation, you not only change the carbon uptake and the temperatures and climate of the European region, you would change all the biology of the, of the North Atlantic. You would, um, uh, there are a host of different effects, which I think um, we would not be used to, and therefore, by definition, we would perceive as negative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Thomas. much.
Okay, our next speaker is Carlo Barbante, the um, Polar Science Institute of the Italian National Research Council and the University of Foscari of Venice. And he'll talk about lessons we learned uh, from looking at Earth's past climates. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, this invitation. Uh, it's really uh, okay it's for me the first conference, international conference after a long period of time, and uh, for most of you, most likely. And I think it's really a renaissance of science, and especially of climate science. And I'm glad to start uh, with this uh, with this lecture. Uh, okay, we we uh, there is a lot of uh, of our future in our past, and so we learn a lot about what is happening. And Thomas mentioned the, uh, the uh, physical science basis IPCC report that came out exactly a month ago, uh, in which we have, oh, sorry, in which we have uh, uh, several information and several uh, line of evidences how climate changed uh, during, uh, uh, during the last uh, few decades, uh, what are the projections for the future, uh, global and regional simulation, and especially a, a paleoclimate perspective. Uh, in the previous, uh, assessment report, uh, uh, there was a full chapter dealing with paleoclimate and now uh, the paleoclimatology is embed, uh, embedded in all, uh, more or less in all chapters because it's incredibly, incredibly important. Let's start with the uh, very funny things because uh, uh, Winston Churchill is not the father of paleoclimatology, but of course uh, he, he said something very interesting because the farther back you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see and that's where most of the uh, details are of our climate system are uh, hidden, are uh, really in, uh, in the past. As you can see, I mean, today we can uh, uh, reproduce uh, uh, the uh, ocean productivity, for instance, looking with the uh, satellites. Uh, we have a, a network of satellites flying over and uh, measuring the chlorophyll with a very high precision and accuracy. We can measure the temperature since uh, more than a century with high precision, but if you want to go back in time, we need, uh, we, need, um, we need paleo records. And we need to go in the deep sediments, lake sediments, to see how the productivity or temperature that we can reconstruct through proxies or substitutes of the temperature or productivity uh, are uh, changing in, uh, in the climate. So all that is extremely important, not just to to know how the past was and to set the scene and to put the reference value, but also to test models as we will, as we will see. So uh, we have a lesson learned from ice core, which I've been already mentioned, from coral, from three rings, which are extremely important because uh, re regionally distributed for marine and lake sediments from uh, the uh, speleo themes, which are uh, brought in the right side of this, um, of this picture. And so we have information uh, on the deep past. Uh, we have to remember that the strength of the sun has increased by about 25, 30% over uh, the age of our planet. Uh, yet uh, Earth remain uh, livable, uh, but uh, alternated through uh, greenhouse eras and, uh, and uh, uh, without boiling the ocean and lakes, of course, and with the uh, ice sheet present in the, in the north and, and in the south pole. Um, it never freezes uh, completely, and uh, those, um, despite that very low, the very low uh, solar radiation, uh, something, uh, something happened. So, let's start from uh, from the deep past. We do know that uh, the um, the um, uh, during the last uh, uh, 4.55 billion years, so the whole age of the Earth, we have this uh, very large interval of uh, of um, uh, of uh, um, Free ice and uh, ice uh, in uh, in the polar in the polar, especially in the polar region. Uh, although the earliest history of the of the planet is poorly understood, we don't have too many uh, record of the of the data, and uh, we know quite uh, quite well what happened in the last 500 million years, uh, in which we have uh, most of the geological record and sedimentary record. We tell us uh, quite precisely that uh, we had ice ages uh, alternating to uh, non-ice uh, period. And especially, of course, the more we get closer to the present time, uh, more information we have about, uh, about uh, the, 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 past, uh, the past climate. 
Um, this is an, a record, very important, which has been uh, already shown in a graph by uh, Thomas a few minutes ago, and this coming from uh, Senogrid, uh, Senozoi Global Reference Painting Foraminifera Carbon and Oxygen uh, uh, Isotope data set, which mostly show us a f a four uh, different period during the last 67 million years of our climate. A very warm house period that uh, spanned for more than 30, uh, 30 million years, uh, during, in, during which we had no ice on Earth during the Paleocene and Eocene period. On, in the middle of this, there was uh, the so-called hot, uh, hot house period, centered more or less in the Eocene, where temperature were uh, much, much higher than today, about uh, 12, 14 degrees higher. And then since then, the Earth uh, cooled down, uh, arriving to another period, which is called the cool house, and then to the high house, the most uh, recent period of time. Uh, those are very important period because it's when, during the Oligocene and Miocene, and, and then the Plio and Pleistocene, the ice sheet uh, built up. Please note that on the right side, there is a, an expansion of the scale showing the last uh, 20,000 uh, years with the, uh, with the uh, last uh, ice age and with the uh, transition toward the, the Holocene, a very uh, important period. What, what drove all these changes on a long time scale, on, on this uh, long time scale? I make a, a long story quite, uh, uh, quite uh, simple because uh, we know that the temperature, sorry, the uh, incoming solar radiation at the very beginning of the Earth history was about 25, 30% lower. And if uh, with a one dimensional numerical climate model that simulate the mean climate of the entire planet uh, suggests that the combination of a weak sun and a greenhouse level that we can take it, uh, let's say 350 parts per million, uh, would have kept the, 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 the earth frozen for at least the first three billion years. Something that we know it didn't happen uh, from the uh, geological, uh, geological record. So um, the, the Earth works on a, on a long time scale like a thermostat, the, the, the chrono thermostat that we have in our houses, and it keeps the temperature uh, quite mild on a very, very long period of time with internal fluctuation due to the uh, orbital parameters that we will see. So if it is too cold, we have less precipitation, we have uh, uh, the, um, uh, we, we have less precipitation and then we have uh, uh, more CO2 that uh, is uh, brought into the atmosphere that warm up the atmosphere. So the temperature can go up and if it becomes too warm, uh, we have of course more precipitation and more CO2 withdraw from the atmosphere. And all this works in a, in a system like you have in the, in the right side of the panel where uh, it is of course uh, um, we have emission from CO2 from the, the vol volcanic ridges, from volcanoes that accumulate into the atmosphere, which is uh, uh, then uh, the accumulation in the atmosphere quite fast compared to the withdrawal of the, of the CO2 back into the rocks and then with the uh, weathering processes, especially hydrolysis, which, uh, draw, uh, which brings back the, the CO2 from the atmosphere into the uh, ocean uh, again. It takes, uh, um, the, 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 the cycle is complete after many, many tens of millions of years, and the delay is mostly caused by the slow spreading and subduction of seafloor compared to the atmospheric processes, which are uh, quite fast. And then, uh, if you want something like that uh, to act as a thermostat, the, the chemical weathering must be sensitive to climatic factors because otherwise there is a trigger that uh, is missing in the, in the system. And we have many of those that, which are listed in the right side uh, of, uh, of um, climatic processes, climatic factor that control long-term processes. Again, chemical weather is, is extremely sensitive to the temperature. It is extremely sensitive to the uh, precipitation and also to vegetation. Just to give you an example uh, of, uh, of one of these feedback, which is actually a negative feedback. If uh, you have an initial change and the, 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 the climate become warmer, uh, you have an increased temperature precipitation, you have increased temperature precipitation, you have an increased vegetation, therefore you have a improved and increased weathering and this increase CO2 removal uh, of course by weathering. And this brings back down and break 
the, the reduction of the initial, initial war, war, warming. So uh, all these on a, on a very long time scale, we are still living within one of these uh, huge and long cycle. We don't have too many information for the, uh, for the very beginning, but uh, uh, there are uh, several explanations about, um, about that. Uh, again, uh, the last few million years are extremely, uh, extremely important. We do have, especially in the ice house, in this last five million years, a very important uh, effect because it's where most of the continents were already in the current position. So ocean circulation, atmospheric circulation uh, are working in a similar way that uh, we, um, we, we, have, um, we have today. Uh, again, uh, what happened in detail on, on that, we have that during the last uh, five million years, we have changes. Uh, of course, there are natural variability. You see this uh, uh, increase and decrease in, in, uh, in the temperature and in the uh, size of the, of the, um, uh, of the, especially of the ice sheet. Uh, and uh, you can note the general trend with the decreasing temperature, but also two main future, uh, which are uh, changing in frequency of uh, these glacial interglacial changes, which are tightly linked as, a, as I already mentioned, to orbital cycle. First, on the first part of the curve, we have a, a periodicity of around uh, 41 kilo years. We'll see it's tightly linked to uh, orbital parameters. And then in the most recent years, uh, an 100 kilo year cycle. So we are moving from a 41 to 100 kilo year cycle, which is not exactly well understood in this, uh, in, in this uh, specific period, which is called the mid Pleistocene transition. Anyway, we have more ample and more a bigger and bigger ice sheet in the most recent years, as you see from this uh, from this uh, uh, graph. And again, those fluctuations are linked to orbital parameters that are brought together. Uh, eccentricity, obliquity, and precession are making a big difference. And when you combine all together, you have a different amount of energy arriving into the Earth's surface that translate into time, so you have from zero to 250,000 years, the amount of energy that arrive at different latitude, for instance, in summer. So those changes are uh, tightly linked to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the climate. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, during the last two million years, uh, you have, in this case, a stack of normalized isotopic oxygen anomalies in deep ocean sediments, that means uh, in this case, uh, more ice and less ice. And if you look at the duration of the single period, you see that during the most recent years, we have a duration which is around 100,000, while if you go in the previous time, uh, we have a duration which is um, different, um, about 40, 41,000. This change is, is extremely important. So the change of regime and mode of, of the, climate, uh, the, the climate mode is extremely important and we do don't completely understand what is going in, in this transition. Um, ice core might come to a rescue for this. Uh, ice core are among the best uh, uh, climatic archives. They contain on the same archive uh, the uh, forcing factors and the response, uh, which is extremely important. And uh, just to give you an idea, in the, uh, I just want to mention three ways in which uh, ice core have changed our perception of climate. And of course, uh, the first one is the quantification of climate forcing, because again, I say uh, that uh, the, the ice core contain on the same record uh, both forcing and response factors, uh, greenhouse gases, volcanic, solar um, forcing, and so on. We have a direct observation of climate and carbon cycle links. The, uh, as we will see in a, in a, in a while, uh, CO2 and temperature uh, are tightly linked uh, during the last at least 800,000 years. And then if we go on a smaller scale, uh, as we have seen on these uh, Danskar Oeschger events, for instance, there is at millennial scale uh, dramatic changes that can be uh, measured in, uh, into, the, into, the, uh, into the ice. Uh, well, uh, uh, temperature, uh, this is Antarctic temperature and CO2 coming from the European um, uh, project for ice scoring in Antarctica, EPICA, which has been an iconic project, reconstructed the, the climate of the past uh, in uh, 800,000 years in very high uh, deta detail. So we see that uh, the tightly coupling of CO2 and temperature 
Of course, uh, uh, if, you, if I want to bring your attention uh, to where we are today, uh, you'll see that the CO2 concentration always oscillate in between about 180 part per million to 280 part per million in, during interglacial period of time. We are today at 415 part per million. So uh, 15 part per million more than when we had the Paris Agreement in, in 2015. And no one in this room, uh, no one alive today, will ever see CO2 concentration falling back below 400 part per million. So we have to keep it in mind as a, as a, as a great warning. And uh, the concentration level have uh, certainly increased at an unprecedented level. So this is very important. CO2 and temperature are, tight, are tightly correlated. Uh, the ice core, as I say, they come to a rescue. There are limitations, however, because when you have precipitation and accumulation, uh, the age of the small bubble of ice which are entrapped uh, into the ice, they have not the same age of the ice uh, nearby because you have diffusion from the surface and when the ice is entrapped, there is uh, younger hair and older ice. So we have to set this, uh, what we call delta H difference in between the ice and the gas to uh, put together the, uh, the um, uh, well, the chicken and egg uh, question that we have. So what is leading and lagging uh, during that period of time? So uh, there are several studies improving in the age scale, especially in the delta age scale, that uh, looking at the uh, gas age and ice age to improve this uh, observation. Uh, well, um, the ice core analysis have uh, clearly shown that the uh, Antarctic temperature and atmospheric CO2, they uh, go together, they are highly correlated. Uh, but uh, using different methods, uh, two studies have demonstrated, uh, two independent methods, two studies have demonstrated that there is a very tight coupling between uh, regional, uh, regional Antarctic temperature and CO2. We have seen that the, the uh, signal that we get into the ice is, uh, is certainly a regional signal, while CO2 is a more global signal. We have seen the role of the Southern Ocean this morning. Um, we have few information about the Southern Ocean, but we have seen that uh, is incredibly is incredibly important. Uh, there are two main motivations uh, because the, the great uncertainty which is still behind these, uh, uh, these statements. One is per se, already I gave it to you, uh, the fact that the gas age, uh, there is a delta in between the gas age and the ice age. We are improving that. And the fact that the uh, CO2 is, uh, is part of a feedback system because if you, for instance, increase the temperature of the water, of the ocean, you have more uh, CO2 degassing from the atmosphere and then uh, it takes part to the uh, greenhouse gas effect and warming the planet. So um, it is a very peculiar point, this one, uh, about the, the lead and lag of the carbon dioxide. But it comes to me, on a, again, on this uh, extremely important period, the mid Pleistocene transition, uh, today is on the left uh, in, this, in this graph. You see the last uh, um, 3.2 million starting from the bottom and then coming to the most recent years. You see the general uh, cooling trend that we have seen already. You see the 41 kilo year periodicity and, uh, of, the, of this uh, uh, fluctuation in climate with high frequency, low amplitude, moving into the present time. So moving in a period of time uh, in which uh, is uh, uh, actually we have a higher frequency and, uh, and um, uh, uh, sorry, higher amplitude and lower frequency. This transition is extremely important. Is uh, uh, the, the mid Pleistocene transition uh, is extremely important because it didn't involve particular changes in solar radiation on Earth orbit, so orbital parameter were uh, behaving like uh, like before, like in the previous million years before. Uh, but uh, there are rather uh, internal component of the, of the of the climate system that are thought to be responsible, and the main uh, uh, the main uh, driver are most likely the ice sheet, uh, definitely ice sheet dynamics. Imagine when you have a situation like this, uh, you have a huge ice sheet, it becomes more difficult to melt the ice sheet. It takes more time. Or other 
other hypotheses uh, can be categorized uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there are internal forcing of the global carbon cycle. Uh, across the mid Pleistocene transition, ice sheet grew larger, become more stable, and they are anyway harder to melt. Uh, during period like this, with a very low temperature, there are a, a paper from uh, Martinez uh, Garcia in a few years ago that uh, uh, testified that there are also more dust into the into the into the um, Earth system. Uh, these more dust have fertilized the ocean, increasing the efficiency of the of the uh, of the biological pump, and therefore uh, setting setting the thing. So there is a lot of information, and we want to know how the system works here, because unless we don't know exactly how the uh, climatic system have changed during this period and what is the uh, interlinking between uh, CO2 concentration and temperature, uh, I think we can't fully understand the, the, the role of, uh, of, um, of uh, the, the, the role, the respective role of CO2 and temperature in the climate system. But for that we need, we would need to have uh, CO2 concentration. Uh, which is not that uh, that uh, uh, obvious. Uh, we need a continuous record of CO2 concentration, at least from 800,000 years to 1.5 million years. And this is uh, what we are seeking today. There is a quest for all the styles in Antarctica. Uh, it seems that we found the place uh, is uh, not that far from uh, Concordia Station in the um, in, uh, in East Antarctica is a place at uh, 3,200 meters in elevation where we do have information from the previous um, European project for ice coring in Antarctica and when we do have modeling of the age of the deepest part of the, oh, sorry, where do we, do we, we, we have uh, the ages of the deepest part of the, of the, of the ice. It looks like that uh, with this new, uh, this new site might hold signal as old as uh, uh, 1.5 million years. So we are almost there in the sense that the camp is there uh, and the drilling will start in, uh, in uh, uh, December, uh, December this year. It will be a great adventure uh, trying to uh, fill a gap into the, into the climate science. Uh, then coming to the most recent years, we have seen how last millennia are important and how many uh, abrupt climate changes we had in the climate system well recorded in the uh, Greenland ice sheet, well recorded in marine sediments uh, that record a persistent transition uh, that occur in a very, very short time scale. We have about 25 Danska Oeschger events uh, in the last 9,000 years. But of course, they are concentrated mostly in glacial period of time, so these huge uh, very quick abrupt climate changes are concentrated in, um, uh, in, in, cold, in cold periods. They have a sort of revolution in many, in many systems of the, of the Earth, uh, especially in the physical climate system, as we have seen in the warming of the ocean, melting of the ice sheet, transformation of Atlantic meridian, mer meridional overturning circulation, effect on sea level rise, which reflect into ecosystem in many ways with hypoxia, with the vegetation loss and so on. And also back to the most recent times uh, in, in society and migration. Imagine our ancestors uh, 40,000 years ago, uh, they have to move because of those abrupt changes that in 20 or 30 years increase the temperature or the average temperature of the surface of about 12 to 15 degrees. But we were, in the inter we, we were in a glacial period of time. So what about uh, past warmer interval? And this is a, an exercise that uh, within the Pages Warmer World uh, Integrative Activity we did a few years ago to try to find a use useful period of time which can be taken as an example for the current interglacial. And uh, the, the period of time where uh, three, especially the what we call the Holocene thermal maximum, about uh, 11 to 5,000 years uh, before. Uh, another period of time was the last integration, which happened uh, at the period at the period of time uh, between 130 and 115,000 years. And then, if we go far back in time, uh, another period was the uh, mid-Pliocene uh, warm period, in which about three million years ago, 
in which the CO2 level were about 300 and 450 parts per million, not that far from where we are today. So we want to see those periods of time, which are, again, uh, CO2 concentration can be seen in this table from pre-industrial value, about 290 parts per, mil per million, um, the um, Holocene uh, thermal um, events about uh, 2060 and the, little, the, the last ice, uh, um, uh, the last uh, integration, which is about 270 and then the, the uh, 3 million years ago, 360, compared to the current, uh, to the current um, uh, scenarios for the future, which reports for instance, for SCP 2.6 in 2100, about 420, one part per million. So basically there are impacts. All these, um, all these three uh, time interval that uh, it has been taken as an example had a strong impact and response uh, in the Earth system. And if you look at that, you can see in green, orange, and purple, the different period of time that I uh, mentioned they, there was an impact on, for instance, Arctic sea ice or on the boreal forest uh, or with an expansion, for instance, during the, uh, um, um, the, the early Holocene or an expansion again during the uh, last uh, interglacial or an expansion during the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the period of time that goes about three, uh, three million years ago. So, although uh, Past warmer war were caused by different forcing. We can't uh, argue that uh, uh, we had a similar forcing that we have today with an increased uh, CO2 value, which of course uh, it might limit the applicability of our finding for future climate change. But nevertheless, we can see how uh, even for a two degree and potentially 1.5 degree global warming, which is targeted by the, by the Paris Agreement, uh, we can have significant impact into the climate system and into the ecosystem, uh, especially terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem will uh, specially be reorganized in the future and they will readapt into, into uh, warmer condition as they did in the past, so there is nothing new. But that's something we have to keep it in, uh, in mind. And then again, uh, we, uh, these experiments was also um, done with some modeling, including the uh, paleo record and looking the earth system sensitivity to changes, for instance, to uh, extreme sea level change, which were modeled and compare it with the, with the observation, which are kept into the, into the red, uh, red color. Again, for instance, for the last uh, uh, integration, uh, the, um, the last integration reconstruction compare to the scenario which brings to the 2.6, uh, the, the modeling, uh, the modeling of the uh, with the R <coughs> sorry <coughs> RCP 2.6 scenario, show that there is definitely with a 40 uh, 420 part per million CO2 concentration, a big um, <coughs> a big a big difference in in terms of um, of temperature. So. Uh, the lesson learned from the past uh, is here, is here in this graph that brings together now the huge and the large um, figure of the, of the last uh, 67 million years with the warm house, the hot house that as we know are caused by <coughs> a very long term process which imply again uh, atmospheric CO2, which imply a cooling uh, which imply the presence of an ice house and the fact that we have a um, polar ice cap uh, is extremely important. And this brings into the future projection, so something that we didn't before, uh, with again with the CO2 concentration which are projected into 2000, 2100 and 2030. So uh, again, uh, we need data, we, need, we don't just need modeling exercise which are fundamental but we need also data for uh, future for uh, targeting and, and, and testing, testing the model. Again, uh, what will be our future? This is a well-known and very uh, famous graph uh, from Stefan, which has been published three years ago in uh, NASA. Again, we are coming uh, from a very different uh, uh, glacial, interglacial oscillation during the last uh, millions of years, uh, but now we are at 
at the limit, you know, we are at the planetary threshold, we are in inputting, we are putting so much CO2 in the atmosphere that either we can have a stabilized Earth, so, and with the stabilization, I keep the, the concept of the medical doctors when they do stabilize a patient, or either we fall down in the future, uh, crossing the planetary threshold into a hot house Earth, which is quite similar to the one that we had millions of years ago in the, in the picture that we have seen before. So concluding, uh, okay, the, the paleoclimate record is extremely important. As I said at the beginning, there is a lot of our future in our past, and it shout us that uh, uh, is quite far from being self-organizing, uh, and the Earth system might overreact even to small changes, as we have seen, and the tipping points is, a, <coughs> is a, an, an, an important issue. The paleo records are also extremely important, not just modeling. We need paleo data to test our model. How can we project into the future if we can't predict what happened in the past? That's an important thing. We have seen that from, uh, from uh, looking at the uh, warm period that uh, even for a two degree, uh, significant impact on the climate system might happen uh, in the ecosystem, terrestrial, marine ecosystem, uh, wetlands can be uh, certainly impact, impacting on that. And of course, uh, crossing this threshold uh, is very dangerous. I want to underline that again, uh, as my previous speakers uh, did it already, uh, because uh, uh, crossing this threshold would uh, lead much higher global average temperature than any integration in the last few million years. Uh, so that's something that we have to carefully consider. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlo, for this great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, if not, in, oh, okay. You wanna come to the microphone, please? Thank you very much, Carla, for a great talk. Um, it, it does occur to me, if when one looks at the, um, at the, you showed the Delta 018 uh, estimates, so Lisecki and Ramo uh, stack, which, um, so what one sees is that the Earth over the last, what, 30 million years or so has been cooling, uh, and the, and there have been these transitions where one goes to larger and slower oscillations. I think if you showed that to any um, engineer, cybernetics engineer, they would say this system looks like it is sliding into a, um, uh, into a transition, into it's becoming, it's moving towards a tipping point, if you like. This uh, slowing down is a, uh, is a hallmark of the approach to a... Uh, um, so it, I think it, it's interesting to speculate, and this is not really um, rel that humans coming along and clearly knocking us out of that, because it seems to me that that record is now is going to fundamentally change almost however we... Um, in, the, in the wider context of the whole Earth's history, it seems like we might have done the planet a favor, right? Because it seems to be... We might have done the... We, we, might, have done, we, we might have done a good thing in the sense that the, the system was, was sliding towards lo larger and longer glaciations, uh, which is not... Which, was in a certain sense, is, you know... Well, it, it, the, the planet seems to or the life on the planet is more diverse when, when it's warmer. So I just put that out as a, you know, we have changed that dynamic completely, perhaps not entirely for the bad, for, the, for a bad reason. Yeah, and, and, and something which has been already mentioned is uh, that uh, we have to improve our uh, ice sheet modeling for the future because the fact that we will have increased, and we already have increased CO2 concentration and greenhouse gas concentration more in general, will have a strong impact, not just on temperature, but on the size of the ice sheet, which is not for tomorrow, because as we all know, ice sheet has a large inertia, but uh, in the, in the 
uh, millennia to come uh, and in the hundreds of thousands of years to come, there will be a huge, a huge um, impact on that as well. Thanks for the comment. Other questions? Roberto Bassi from the Academy of Linchay, and thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question out of my ignorance on the paleo data. Um, together with the uh, paleo data on CO2 concentration from ice and other, uh, do you have also paleo data uh, describing the uh, distribution of vegetation on, uh, on the land? Uh, uh, on the land in, during the same period of year, or is that out of our reach? No, you, you have many other proxies that can describe you changes in vegetation, including pollen, for instance, yeah. uh, that can tell There's a lot, of course, pollen. because a certain pollen can live under uh, mm -hmm. within a certain range of temperature. Uh, you have other proxies like uh, um, molecular organic proxies that can tell a lot of you about the type of vegetation that you have. Um, in many records, in many paleo records like uh, lake sediments, uh, marine sediments, terrestrial record like peat box, for instance, but also in ice core, we are improving our capability to detect uh, uh, organic compounds uh, very, very, uh, in a very high precision and, and, and accuracy. And does it, how does it correlate uh, with the CO2 concentration? Uh, well, uh, it, it more or less correlates with the temperature because when you have higher temperature, higher precipitation, you have uh, a, a wider, wider uh, vegetation and uh, CO2 goes at the same way. Okay. Then there is also a lot of modeling, um, ecosystem modeling uh, done with this kind of data. Thanks a lot. So I do have uh, a question, actually a couple of questions, right? Uh, you mentioned the importance of having more data, and I think this is something that we all agree to, even to uh, characterize the present, uh, the, the, the present day climate, right? Um, so we would love more data, more variables, at more locations, deeper reconstructions in time, but if you really have to invest because resources are limited, you mentioned already CO2 reconstructions, but what are the key variables that we should invest on um, and what, again, what, what, how, how long, deep in time should we go uh, to get the, again, the critical information to, be, to make significant okay. process on some of the outstanding Point taken. questions. Uh, always, uh, scientists always claim that we, they need more data and more money. Uh, okay, if the, the amount of money is limited, I would say we have to, um, to stick with the limited period of time. I would say the last five million years is, a, is, a, is an important period because, again, continents were already in the position where they are today. So we are taking a picture of a situation which is uh, similar to the one that we, we have today. Uh, and we need more data on carbon cycle. I mean, but CO2 uh, can be directly measured only in ice cores. And we don't know if we will be able to find ice as old as 1.5 million years as a continuous record. We can extract um, CO2 data from boron isotopes into the, into the deep marine sediments. Um, we need to know about paleoproductivity, which is not uh, easy to, to reconstruct. Um, and and uh, of course, then uh, devils is in the detail, so I can go on with many other things. And one final, oh, I, sure. I just also wanted to ask, um, you mentioned models. Uh, uh, what is it that we, in terms of uh, reproducing past climates, do you see some criticalities in terms of how certain processes are being represented in state-of-the-art climate models that the community should work on. You mentioned already ice sheet, but is there any other critical process that you think is, is really missing or not well represented? Yeah, I, I, in think, our I think another uh, key issue of, of um, uh, big ice sheet is, is one of the problem uh, and, uh, and productivity, how, how productivity and vegetation will change to, to changes in, in the increased temperature and uh, in a high CO2 world. Thank you. Sure. The, there are some questions on the... No, before, you, you first. <laughs> Again, 
Ronaldo from the home for the home team. Uh, kind of beautiful talk indeed. I, I want to follow up on something that Roberto Bassi just asked you. Because he was talking about the distribution of plants on land. Now, a poor hydrologist knows that uh, one important feature that you can do from time series would be to generate spatial correlations, right? Like if you have lots of, well, what we do in space, we do a measure with precipitation, which is much easier than what you guys do. But uh, you do that in space, you generate uh, some covariance functions or whatever, something which uh, it says that's a perfect correlation if the distance grows to, goes to zero, and it becomes zero in, in some infinite time in which you essentially exceed a correlation length of some kind. Now, distribute to answer Roberto's question, you would have to take, in fact, all the course you have, and whatever you do uh, in time, you, have, you can project it in space. Has it ever been done? Uh, I'm not an expert on that, <coughs> but there are a lot of paleoecological uh, record, mostly taken in uh, lake sediments, mostly taken in uh, peat box, uh, which goes all over the world, and there are fantastic data set that show you all, um, all the data. Uh, well, uh, there are correlation, uh, but I can't answer completely to your question. Yeah. But the, no, da the data are no, there question, anyway. Yeah, but my question is, would that be a, a relevant question? I think so, yes. That would be a relevant question uh, uh, to understand uh, how, veget for instance, vegetation evolve, type of vegetation evolve, and how it will evolve into the future. Yep. We have some questions from either yes, uh, the chat or... I, we received a question by Scafetta, Nicola Scafetta. I read uh, what he writes. The last interglacial was clearly warmer than today. However, during the period, the CO2 levels were far lower. Thus, it seems that CO2 concentration cannot modify significantly the global temperature. Arguments that today the Earth needs more time to manifest the CO2-induced warming does not fit with geological data that show negative correlation between CO2 record and temperature. The argument ignores several astronomical forcing as those linked to cosmic rays related to the position of the solar system with the galaxy within the galaxy that correlates with the larger climatic cycles in the latest 600 million years. Any comment? Well, it has all been taken into account, all this um, uh, kind of, uh, let's say, um, external uh, influence of solar forcing. Uh, but as far as we have from uh, um, attribution and detection of climate change, we clearly see the role of green, not just CO2, but other greenhouse gases into the system. So uh, this uh, is uh, re really un undisputable what the role of uh, CO2 and, uh, and, and other greenhouse gases is in the especially anthropogenic greenhouse gases, is in warming the current climate. Are there any more questions? If not, let's thank both our speakers of uh, the second session, of course, everybody who participated to the discussion. Thank you.